Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today and welcome to today's session. My name is Barry Osman and my pronouns are he, him, his. I'm a manager with Ben City Investment Management. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge that we're speaking to you from the Coast Salish Territory, represented today by the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh Na First Nations. They have been custodians of this land for thousands of years, and I would like to pay my respect to both elders, past and present. Today's webinar is the first of a three webinar series about estate planning. We will focus today on end of life planning and an overview of estate planning, as well as the role of an executor. With this in mind, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Peter Topping, the executive director of the Memorial Society of BC. Peter is going to speak about topics that will respond to your questions after the, sorry, Peter will respond to your questions after the presentation. However, if you feel like you would like to post a question, please post it in the Q&A section of this presentation. A little bit about Peter. He's an innovative, strategic, and authentic leader with over 25 years of experience working within the not-for-profit sector. He currently serves as the executive director of the Memorial Society of BC. Former positions have included Director of Community Health at the YMCA of Greater Vancouver and co-creator and manager of pa Patient Voices Network with Impact BC. He has a strong interest in end-of-life issues, fostered through extensive work with seniors and people with, living with chronic health conditions and from personal experiences with the loss of loved ones. Peter volunteers as a mentor with Rainbow Refugee Society and sits on the board of directors for Dignity Senior Society. He is an avid nature enthusiast and enjoys leading courses in plant identification. With this in mind, I will be passing it over to Peter. Thanks, Barry, for the warm welcome, and thank you to Van City for the opportunity to present today. And hello, everyone. Um, end of life planning is not always an easy topic, and so I'm very delighted and amazed to see so many people join us today for this uh, webinar. I do hope that you find the information useful and that it inspires you to begin the process if you haven't already done so. As Barry mentioned, I am the Executive Director of the Memorial Society of British Columbia, and I've been in that role for about a year and a half, and I'm very honoured to help lead this organization forward along with a dedicated board of directors and an amazing staff team. I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge that the Office of the Memorial Society in Vancouver is located on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Um, the Memorial Society of BC is also privileged to partner with funeral providers across many traditional on unceded First Nation territories through these beautiful lands that we call British Columbia. In terms of the agenda for today's uh, presentation, I'm going to begin with a discussion of what is meant by end of life planning. Why is it important and when is the right time to consider it? We will then explore the role of an executor and what to consider when selecting an executor for your estate. I will provide an overview of the Memorial Society of British Columbia, essentially all the, the many good things that we do. And given the growing concern about the environment amidst all these crazy climate changes, uh, I thought it would be important that my people might be interested to learn about the greener options for the disposition of one's body as to reduce the impact on the environment. And hopefully we're going to have some time for questions and I always enjoy and hopefully we'll have a, a rich discussion as well. Most people generally think of wills when they hear the term end of life planning. Wills are only one aspect and end of planning is more complex and includes a number of components. It is also a very, it can also be a very emotional journey and it can involve or entail some very difficult and challenging conversations along the way. 
In this slide, I included check all that apply, and I would invite you to take a moment to ask yourselves which of these um, items or components you may have heard of that you may be familiar with, or which of them you may have already put into place. So wills are serving an important part of end of life planning. Recent data from the Angus Reid Institute finds that 50% of Canadians don't have a last will and testament. As you might expect, younger Canadians are less likely to have one, but even half of those between the ages of 45 and 55 don't have a will. In the age group 55 plus, about one in five don't have a will in place. And the, of those who do indicate that they have a will, they've also indicated that the will was not up to date. A will enables you, a will is a document that enables you to document your wishes about important matters like property, assets, and guardianship of your children upon your death or when you die. In Canada, if you die without a will, it's called dying intestate. When that happens, your money, assets, and debts are put into an estate, and a court-appointed representative closes your financial affairs and distributes your assets according to the rules and regulations of your province. I think we've all seen in the news uh, cases where someone dies without a will, and often it ends up in the courts. It can be a very awful legal dispute, and it often can also tear families apart. So again, it's really important to document your wishes in, in a will. I think it's very timely for this webinar because actually October 1st to October 7th in British Columbia is Make a Will uh, Week. So I think that is another good reminder that uh, if you haven't already done so, it may be a good time to consider putting a will in place. A power of attorney gives a third party, usually your executor, lawyer, or loved one, the authority to take care of your financial and legal matters. This could include paying bills, managing investments, or selling real estate on your behalf. It does not allow the third party to make any decisions about your personal health care or personal care, so it is strictly financial. A standard representation agreement is a document in which you choose a person called a representative who can help you make decisions when needed. So in this case, it would be kind of supported decision making. So they're uh, making decisions or supporting you in making your decisions. Or for you in the event that you are no longer able to do so. In this case, it would be considered substituted decision making. Um, and again, the decisions are specifically around health care and personal care matters. So again, a little bit different from power attorney, which is focused on legal and financial matters, while a representation agreement specifically addresses your health care and personal care needs. A representative can be present during medical appointments, can access medical information and files, and certainly commute with, com communicate with healthcare providers on behalf of the individual. And a representative can also make decisions about treatment as well. Advanced care planning, it's, in, it's important that you have a conversation with your loved ones and healthcare providers about advanced care planning while you are healthy. So there may be a time when you cannot decide for yourself um, you may be ill, very ill, or near death, and your loved ones would, will need to know what kind of care you want unless you have, excuse me, and your loved ones won't know what kind of care you want unless you have taken time to communicate that to them beforehand. So, if, for example, in your, in your event care directive, you can indicate your wishes around accepting or refusing specific health treatments and it can also include a do not resuscitate order. And lastly, end of life 
planning also involves giving thought and sharing your with your executor and your loved ones what you would like to do about your funeral or more specifically about the distribute disposition of your body. So whether you wish to be buried, cremated or donate your body. So in British Columbia, the body donation program is managed by the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia for the purposes of training and research. And so I think, again, the donation of one's body for training and research is a very um, altruistic and noble gesture as well. Funeral planning also entails communicating your wishes uh, with your loved ones or your executor, whether you would prefer a more traditional funeral service, which may include a religious component, or a celebration of life, which has become more popular in recent years. And typically, celebrations of life usually focus on sharing stories and memories of the deceased in a more casual setting. Um, so these are just some of the components of uh, end of life planning. And again, uh, we will talk a little bit more about the, the importance of that. So in North American Western cultures, um, there is a general reluctance to talk about end of life planning. People find it awkward, uncomfortable. It may create fear and anxiety. So a lot of us tend to avoid having these discussions again with our loved ones. So why is end of life uh, planning important? End of life planning ensures that an individual wishes will be respected at end of life and after death. As we discussed earlier, it includes everything from decisions affecting your health care to the distribution of your assets, as well as the disposition of your body. But I would say equally important, it's also about saving your loved ones the hardship of having to make these decisions for you. They'll want to focus their energy and attention on spending time with you at end of life and grieving when you have passed. Um, I personally like to view end of life planning as an act of kindness. Um, it really is about sparing your loved ones of having to make these difficult decisions during a very difficult time. So I think, again, it, it's both wanting to make, ensure that your wishes are respected upon death, but it's also about giving kind of, kind of a blueprint to your family, your executor, your loved ones, so that they can honour your wishes as well, but also having to spare them, having to make those very difficult decisions when, again, at a time that they might be uh, grieving for your loss. So when is the right time to consider end of life planning? And the, the, you know, the short answer is that there is no one right time. And probably many of you have probably guessed that. And it largely depends on personal circumstances. But here are some general guidelines. So if you buy property or have children, it's generally advisable to have a will done soon afterwards, especially to appoint guardianship for your children. If you're beginning to experience significant health issues, it may be a good idea to start considering a power of attorney, representation agreement, advanced care planning, and funeral planning. The unfortunate reality is that we're not always given the gift of pre-planning, as death can occur unexpectedly. The more that we have documented and put into place, the more that we've had conversations again with our loved ones, with our executor, the greater likeliness is that our wishes will be respected at end of life and upon death. This coming Saturday is the fall equinox or the first day of fall in the northern hemisphere. Um, I always enjoy a good analogy and I like to view the four seasons as a metaphor for life. So if the average person in Canada uh, lives to 80 to 85, fall would be equivalent to being in our 40s to 60s. And I think this is a really good time in one's uh, good place in one's life to start giving thought to end of life and to be in having those conversations with those around you. It's also around this time that we may experience the loss of our parents or other friends or other family members. And I found that this often acts as the catalyst for many people to start giving more thought to their own end of life planning. 
in terms of my own personal experiences, my father passed away very unexpectedly in his early 70s. Um, nothing had been discussed, nothing had been put into place. Um, but again, it was a it was a really learning opportunity for both um, my mother and the children. And it did kind of prompt my mother to start putting into a place a lot of the the components that we talked about today or, or talked about earlier. Um, and I believe we're going to a poll. So I'm going to. Thanks, Peter. Our first poll about uh, having wealth. And if you could uh, please take a moment to read the question and just give us your, your uh, vote here. I think it would be really helpful to get a general idea of how the audience feels about having a, an up-to-date will in place. So we'll take a moment until uh, uh, everyone had an opportunity to vote and then uh, your votes are anonymous. So no, no names will be shared. It's just a, a, a poll with uh, indicating the number of uh, uh, the, the votes. Thank you. OK, and we have the results uh, for our first poll, uh, poll and uh, it looks like uh, we're sitting at 50 percent at no, but I've been meaning to, to get my uh, will in place and up to date. So and the second uh, closest uh, answer is uh, 30 percent for yes. And the rest are between yes, uh, but it's uh, not up to date and it's complicated. So that's our first poll. I'll uh, go on and pass it on back to Peter. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the poll results are very interesting. It it kind of mirror mirrors the the results of the Angus Reid um, the, the Angus Reid poll that we we I cited earlier. So we're at, roughly we're looking at fifty percent currently don't have a will in place, and I think it's one of those things that many of us are aware of the need to put a will in place, but it's always a matter of time. Sometimes it's a matter of, of, of expense, um, but certainly again, it, it really is an important thing for both yourself as an individual, but also in terms of against um, giving direction uh, to your executor and your loved ones about how your wishes can be best uh, served upon your death. Thanks everyone. We have one more poll before we go into the next segment. And it's about having firsthand experience uh, administering an estate as an executor. Coming right up. If you could please take a moment and uh, uh, give us your vote, we'd really appreciate it. All right, thank you. And um, the votes are in. Uh, maybe we'll go with the count of uh, a 30 70 split, 30% uh, yes, and 70% not having had firsthand experience being uh, uh, in uh, taking on the administration of an estate. Thanks, everyone. Back to you, Peter. Thanks, Barry. Yeah, so um, definitely wanted just to spend a few minutes talking about uh, who you should name as your executor and what is the role of an executor. I know that for myself, um, I've been designated an executor for a couple of friends, um, but I have not had the experience as yet of actually having to fulfill that role of executor. Um, so I think, again, a lot of us kind of accept these invitations to be executors um, without sometimes fully understanding what that role involves.
Uh, yeah. um, okay, so so we definitely wanted to spend a little bit of time just ex uh, kind of outlining some of the details of an executor. So typically, people <clears throat> typically choose a family member or close friend, and this may be fine if your estate is relatively simple and straightforward. But here are some considerations to take into account when ex selecting an executor. I think I actually jumped ahead. My apologies. I just got a little bit confused there. So I think one of the most important uh, decisions you will be making is who to select for your executor for your will. And um, typically, but not always, the same individual that you choose as your role as your executor for your will um, is often sometimes also asked to be the representative um, for we talked about your representation representative agreement, and it all could be the person who has the power of attorney as well. So not always, but often they're often the same person that's given that with various responsibilities. So again, certainly uh, making choosing or deciding to who pick a role, the two to choose as your role of executor, is in fact one of the most important decisions that you will be making in end of life planning. And so before selecting executor, it's important to understand what an executor does. And at a very high level, an executor is responsible for administering your estate upon your death. And so this would include gathering all required documents. And again, the best thing that you could do um, in terms of, of supporting your executor is really to gather a lot of all those important documents and put them in one place. So whether it be in an electronic copy, electronic copies in a file on your computer or paper copies somewhere in your desk or in a filing cabinet and letting your executor know where he can find or he or she can find those documents readily. It also means dealing with all the assets and insurance, property and household relating to your estate, dealing with all costs related to administering the estate, keeping detailed records and accounting, dealing with all the tax, legal and regulatory filings and requirements, um, dealing with the beneficiaries of the estate, and certainly it also includes arranging the funeral. So as you can see, it can be a lot of work and becomes more involved the more complex one's estate is. So the question is, who should you name as your executor? So I, as, as I mentioned just a bit earlier, uh, people will typically choose a family member, a close friend, and this may be fine if your estate is relatively simple and straightforward. But here are some considerations to take into account when selecting an executor. So does the executor live in the same jurisdiction? There may be added complexities if the executor lives at a province or in a different country. The age of the executor, is the executor likely to outlive the individual who has made the will? So again, we tend to pick partners, family members, or friends who are in our own age group. And the good thing about wills is the option to appoint a secondary executor should your first choice predecease you. Does the executor have the skills, proficiency, and time to fulfill their role, especially for more complex estates? Being an executor can take quite a bit of time and involve a lot of paperwork. Does the executor have good communication skills in dealing with multiple parties, including the beneficiaries, and able to keep detailed and accurate records? So not everyone necessarily has these skills as well. And is the executor prepared for personal liabilities? So while the executor of a will or an estate will need to see the oversee the payment of debts from the assets of the estate, the executor is not personally liable for debts. However, if the executor makes errors while administering an estate, they may be personally liable for any expenses related to these errors. So again, you're wanting to select an individual who has, again, the skills and proficiency and time, uh, especially if, if there are liabilities um, in place or any areas made during the administration of an estate. And certainly consider other as needed. Um, 
If there is no one close to you, you could appoint a professional such as a trust company to act as your executor. If you do go this route, it's best to check beforehand what their fees would be. So whether um, appointing a family, a uh, friend, a uh, trust company, it's always best to check in with them beforehand and get to get their OK before um, designating them as your executor in your will. Uh, no one would want a surprise. I certainly wouldn't appreciate getting a call um, letting me know that I've been designated as an executor um, without knowing that beforehand as well. Okay. So now I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the Memorial Society of British Columbia. And do we have a poll here? Great. I'm jumping ahead. There's a poll coming up. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, the poll will be coming up on your screen momentarily. And I will let, uh, let you know when the poll uh, has completed. So it's uh, right in front of you in any second now. The question is, have you heard of the Memorial Society of British Columbia? And if you could take a moment, please, and let us know your, your vote. Sorry, I've seen a few comments that some of you may have had some difficulty seeing the polls pop up on your screen. Um, we will take a, a moment uh, to allow for the uh, votes to, to show up and for the poll to tabulate the results. But I do apologize if it's not working on your end. Uh, it, could, uh, it could be a, a technical setup uh, that we are encountering. Um, thank you. And I will be uh, sharing the poll results any moment now. Okay, and for this particular poll, uh, we have uh, about 35% of our respondents have heard of the Memorial Society of BC and the rest haven't yet. So this is a great segue for the next uh, part, but we do have one other poll before we pass that on and Peter will be covering information about the Memorial Society of BC and this other uh, aspect that we're gonna ask you to give us your votes on. And it's regarding having a, a green option for uh, end of life. And if you could please take a moment uh, to tell us how important is it for you to have a green disposition option. And uh, the poll uh, is up on the screen right now. Uh, if you're able to see it, please uh, take a moment and give us your vote. OK, and we can tabulate this vote right now and the results are posted in the poll uh, results and it looks like the highest uh, percentage is somewhat important uh, and uh, we're split across the, the spectrum as far as whether it's uh, very important or indifferent or not important. Thank you, everyone. And uh, with this, this particular poll has concluded. I will be passing it back to Peter to walk us through the next uh, session. Thanks, Barry. Yeah, I'm. I'm always. Um, I always find it curious and interesting when we ask people about whether they or not they've heard about the Memorial Society of British Columbia. So we have been around since 1956. Um, so it was created in 1956 as a not-for-profit, non-denominational organization. And so we are registered under the BC Societies Act and operate under the direction of a volunteer board of direction, a board of directors rather. Um, so again, I'm always curious to know whether people are aware of us. Um, we are definitely needing to do more promotion and outreach to let folks know that we exist. Um, but I also take comfort from the fact that we get a steady stream of new members every month and they are coming to us largely by word of mouth from existing members. So it's very reassuring that we must be doing something right if they are referring their family and friends to us. But having said that, 
we certainly need to be doing some more greater promotion outreach, letting people know that this important resource exists in British Columbia. Um, the Memorial Society of BC has had over 250,000 members since it opened in 1956, making it one of the largest memorial societies in North America. Uh, the Memorial Society of BC is not unique, as there are equivalent societies in several provinces in Canada, as well as throughout the US. Uh, so, for example, east to us in Alberta, the Cooperative Memorial Society has existed since 1966, while south to us in Washington State, the People's Memorial Association was founded in 1939. Memorial societies are often the only independent source of uh, information about the funeral in industry in North America. Our vision at the Memorial Society is to ensure that all British Columbians have access to affordable, informed, and easy end-of-life arrangements. Our work is guided by our organizational values of integrity, respect, compassion, advocacy, and education. Um, at the cornerstone of the Memorial Society is our partnership with funeral service providers. It is important to clarify that the Memorial Society itself is not a funeral provider, as there is sometimes confusion around this. Our current model at the Memorial Society is to partner exclusively with independent funeral providers throughout British Columbia, many of which are family owned. Independent funeral providers are more likely to share our commitment to affordability, dignity and simplicity. Funeral providers that are part of larger conglomerates, many of which are US uh, owned or based, can be significantly more expensive for the average consumer. And the other thing with independent versus the larger conglomerate is the, the aspect of uh, overselling. So it's the idea of trying to convince uh, individuals to purchase services and products that they don't really need or want. So certainly, again, that's part of our, our commitment or relationship with the independent ones is that they don't subscribe to the notion of uh, overselling. As a member of the Memorial Society, members would be eligible for reduced pricing on the cost of services and products uh, when they use one of our contracted funeral providers. At this time, we have contracts with over 19 funeral provider sites serving over 70 communities in the province. And this would include providers in the Vancouver Lower Mainland, the Fraser Valley, Vancouver Island, the interior and northern British Columbia. Having said that, we do acknowledge that there are some areas in the province that are underserved and we're working on, on identifying funeral providers in those key areas as well. Um, another aspect of the Memorial Society is providing members with a safe and secure site to, to store important information. So each member is provided with an online account that they can access through a portal on our website. And their online account represents a safe and secure place where they can store their vital statistics and arrangement information. And so what do we mean by that? Vital statistics information includes the information that is used to register your death. It includes your legal name, address, birth information, such as date and place, names of parents, family physician, executor, or next of kin. So you can see the value in having all this information gathered and stored in one place. It would certainly save your loved one or executive, um, executor having to run around trying to collect this information upon your death. Arrangement information includes information such as the type of ser funeral service that you would like upon your death, whether cremation, a conventional green burial, or again, donation, body donation. It can include whether you would like um, a funeral service, a memorial service, or no service at all. And what to be done with your ashes if cremated, scattered, buried, or interned. So not everyone is computer savvy, and we often deal with uh, older folks and over, older gen demographic that may not be technically savvy. And so we do make these forms available to them as well. Um, the member support is another important service provided by the Memorial Society. 
we have two frontline staff um, who provide amazing and compassionate support to members and their families. During a typical week, we receive all kinds of questions from new and existing uh, members about end of life planning. The support by the support provided by our staff becomes particularly important when the death occurs. So when a member dies, the standard process is for the member's family to give us a call. We will then refer the family to a contracted funeral provider in their community. So it may sound straightforward, but people are often distraught and overwhelmed. In many cases, our staff are often the first people the family has reached out to when their loved one has passed away. And our staff do an amazing job in listening and reassuring the families that the Memorial Society is there to support them through the process as needed. And we do have an answering service for calls outside of business hours so that families can reach us 24 seven. And the Memorial Society is also there to advocate on behalf of members. So in the vast majority of cases, families of members are very satisfied with the services provided by our contracted funeral providers. Um, there is the rare instance where we may hear back from a family who may not have had an ideal experience. Our staff will listen to the family and then check in with the funeral provider to gather more information and act as an advocate or mediator as required. The final aspect of the Memorial Society that I'd like to talk about is the importance of education. So this is an area that I'm particularly interested in and see it as a crucial role for memorial societies. As I referenced earlier, there is a, re a reluctance in, in, especially in Western societies, to talk about death and dying. It conjures up fear and anxiety, although death is an inevitable part of life. So there are four areas in which I see education can be, play a significant role. Um, part of our mandate is to help our members increase their understanding of the funeral industry as it can be very rather complex to navigate and people are often in a very emotional state as well. So, for example, this would be helping members understand how death certificates are issued, how to apply for the Canada death benefit, what to do should someone die while traveling, traveling outside of Canada. The second area is end of life resources. So there are amazing uh, resources out there to support individuals and their families with end of life planning. The BC government has great resources on wills, representation agreements, and powers of attorney. Dying with Dignity is a great resource on made medical assistance in dying. And the and if someone is struggling with grief uh, upon losing a loved one, the BC Bereavement Helpline offers free peer-led grief support. So these are only a few of the available resources out there, and certainly part of our role is to profile and, and share information about those resources to our membership. Um, in the earlier poll around the greener options for dis 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 disposition of one's body, a good 50% of you thought this was important or very important. Um, so while the with the environmental crisis, we are receiving more inquiries from people asking about options that have a reduced environmental impact. Um, so certainly in British Columbia, apart from body donation that I mentioned earlier, your options are essentially cremation and burial. Currently about 70% of Canadians opt for cremation. You may not be aware that cremation is generally not considered an environmentally friendly practice. It, it takes considerable amounts of energy to cremate a body, and the process results in significant emissions of carbon dioxide and other pollutants into the air. And as you may know, carbon dioxide is a major contributing factor to global warming. In terms of burials, Burials can be very expensive, especially with the rising costs of burial plots, and many, many, many cemeteries are simply running out of space. But there is also considerable scientific uh, research that conventional ground burials can cause serious uh, environmental contamination. This is due to the leaching of pollutants into the groundwater from the caskets, from the embalming process, and even from the disc decomposition of the body itself. 
It also has been linked to higher levels of bacteria and viruses as well. So there is a trend away from what we call traditional casket burials to what people are now calling green burials to help mitigate some of these negative impacts. So green burials, people are trying to reduce the impact in the environment by skipping the embalming process, and the body is often buried in the ground in a bio. on Jewish beliefs and practices regarding end of life. And you can certainly find that article on our website and more articles are planned for coming months. So this really brings us to the end of the presentation. I, I realize I covered an awful lot of information in the last uh, 45 minutes, and I do hope that it provides a good overview of end of life planning. Um, here is the contact information for the Memorial Society of British Columbia, and certainly please feel free to contact us, uh, contact us uh, should you like to learn more or have questions about what we do. And I'm going to pass it over to Barry. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, that was really great of you to share all of uh, this information and for our audience members um, uh, would like to let you know that Man City also offers uh, complimentary uh, will and estate planning. So uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, there is uh, the information uh, below with uh, the uh, web address to book an appointment with our will and estate uh, consultant uh, to have a consultation about will and estate planning. Uh, we don't provide legal advice, so of course, you know, this is something that we highly recommend when it comes to putting your will in place and prepare for your estate that you have the uh, consultation with um, experts who specialize in will and estate planning. However, you can certainly book an appointment to speak to us uh, to get an idea about some of the things that you want to take into consideration as you prepare for your meeting. Uh, to, to have a formal will, will in place or have a revision to your will or to sort of like get an idea what to prepare for and what to include. Um, we, we did complete our presentation and we have uh, some uh, questions uh, that are here as well and we will be sharing a poll uh, momentarily. Uh, but maybe Peter, if I could just ask you the first question and that comes to, to, uh, to us from the audience. Maybe if you could speak a little bit from your experience about the general costs associated with end of life planning, especially burial or funeral arrangements. And what are some of the things that, um, you know, our audience members should take into consideration when they're thinking about that final expense? Great, thanks, Barry. Great question. Um, so again, when we again we encourage people to consider um, using or accessing what we call again the independent funeral providers in British Columbia. The cost for a basic cremation would be anywhere from about a thousand dollars to maybe twenty five hundred dollars depending on the community in which you're living. Um, again if you were to um, access again the larger conglomerates you may be looking at significantly higher costs upwards of five thousand dollars. So there is quite a cost differential between again going with, again, what we call the independent family-owned funeral providers versus using or accessing one of the larger conglomerates, again, some of which are U.S.-owned. The cost of burial is, is significantly higher than uh, the cost of a basic cremation, and it largely depends whether someone already has a burial plot. So many families have purchased burial plots in the past when they were a lot cheaper, and so that you know that the burial plot is available and it would depend again whether the family chooses to go with a casket a traditional casket whether they want to um, go with a uh, the embalming process and so forth and so on and whether they want kind of to purchase a service as part of that so again um, burials can be upwards of you know twenty thousand dollars so significantly higher than the basic cremation um, I was reading recently an interesting article about how, um, you know, that the funeral industry or the funeral sector keeps shifting and, you know, the, the younger generations uh, or the current generations um, are a little bit more um, cost conscious 
Um, so I think the idea of going with traditional barriers is slowly being replaced by cremation, and it's being driven in part by the, the simple cost of, of, of funerals and burials. So. Thank you. Now we have a, a number of questions, so please uh, continue to post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, this question I can uh, certainly take on, and I, uh, the question is around um, professional services that provide executor um, administration on behalf of uh, a person who's planning their estate. And there are certainly a number of uh, corporate executors that you can uh, research uh, out there, but uh, here at Van City, uh, we do uh, um, uh, refer uh, to Concentra, uh, trust and estate services that uh, they, they can, as a corporate executor, they can certainly uh, uh, provide uh, that service uh, for for you. Um, but there are a number of different uh, corporate executors out there, so it's not limited to Concentra Trust. But this is one of the uh, organizations that uh, we have dealt with in the past. Um, another question that comes up uh, and. Uh, Peter, I, I'm hoping that you you can shed some light on this. What is the difference between the Memorial Society of BC and NADUS uh, or NIDUS? And I'm not quite uh, sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, so please excuse me. Uh, but I'll pass it to Peter if he can shed a little more light on that. And I, I'm not going to be very much help because I'm not familiar with the organization. I mean, I've heard it referenced, but again, my apologies. I just can't speak to what their their mandate is, so, but I will certainly be looking it up. Thank you for that, Peter. Um, there was another question uh, regarding the uh, additional information and resources around uh, uh, medically assisted uh, um, end of life. Um, is that information available through the Memorial Society of BC? And where can our audience members go and get some of that information? So really, if you're if you're looking at um, or wanting to explore the, the medical assistance in dying, probably the best resource that we would recommend is Dying with Dignity be Canada. Um, it's a phenomenal uh, national organization with lots of uh, resources um, available um, on their website. And they do periodically offer uh, webinars as well to the public. So a really amazing webinar. Um, it's been interesting because in the year and, the, and a half that I've been at the Memorial Society, we have certainly seen our fair share of members coming to us, letting us know that they have uh, they are in the process of arranging for medical assistance and dying and want again to put everything in place prior to that event. So certainly um, it is. It is happening. I read one statistic recently that BC has the highest uh, incidences, or um, I don't know if incidence is the correct word, but the highest cases of people choosing uh, medical assistance and dying as well. Um, the other, if I could just make another quick point, is the um, the Deaf Doulas um, Network International is another phenomenal resource. Uh, both that's available in British Columbia, and I'm not sure if people are familiar with deaf doulas. It, it is kind of comparable to a, Beth, a birth doula. So these are trained individuals that will work with individuals and their family, uh, supporting, uh, providing companionship, support, advocacy through the um, end of life uh, process. And um, again, a phenomenal resource that's available out there. Um, and uh, they can also help uh, mediate or facilitate some of those challenging, difficult conversations uh, at end of life as well. Um, deaf dealers do not provide legal or, or treatment or medical care, but they're a really great, um, again, support around uh, facilitating some of those end of life conversations. Thanks, Peter. And I see some of you still have your hands up. So if you have a question, if you could please, uh, just the format of this particular webinar does not allow us to uh, um, um, 
put the mic back to the audience. It's limited to just the presenters. So if you have a question, uh, please post it in the Q&A section. Um, but I know a couple of questions came up on, around uh, having the contact information of the Memorial Society of BC again. We will certainly provide you with that um, uh, and also provide a recording of this presentation. So if you're interested in going back and, and listening to some of the parts that Peter covered, uh, we will share that when it becomes available as, as soon as uh, we can. Um, there are some questions more around wills and legal aspects of estate planning and executorship and, and whatnot. And they're quite broad in nature. And I don't want to speak on behalf of Peter, but I some of these questions are quite technical in nature. But maybe I can go back to Peter with just a general question. If someone is seeking uh, to appoint an executor, I know you covered some of these points, but maybe some final reminders around what to keep in mind, what to consider as far as appointing a, an executor. And on the other end, if someone has been appointed an executor, what are some of the key things that they should really keep in mind? Yeah, so I think again, I think the important piece for me is if you are doing well and you're in that process of selecting an executor, I think it's really important to have a conversation with the, the person that you would like to designate and, and assess their, their comfort level in taking on that responsibility. Um, I think, again, many of us, when we're approached, feel honoured, but we may not necessarily really understand you know, what it involves. And I think sometimes it's okay to say, you know, this is maybe outside of my scope. I, I'm, you know, really not good with paperwork or, you know, I'm, I'm supporting my parents. Um, we're dealing with some health issues. I don't have necessarily the time and resources to take on uh, added responsibilities. Um, I think that the, the other important part, and I keep coming back to this idea of the, the age requirement. Um, I think, again, we tend to look laterally, you know, choosing family members, our friends that are often in the same age group. So I think, again, it's it's important to kind of give thought to um, some folks that you may know, whether it's a niece, a nephew, uh, a neighbor that is, you know, possibly, um, hopefully will still be around upon your death as well. Um, and then there are also some really great resources out there. So should you take on the role of as an executor, and then find yourself um, having to administer an estate. There are some really amazing online resources um, that can help uh, support you in that role as well. Um, so I, and again, the, with the advance of obviously the, the internet and the website, there's an abundance of, of resources out there. Um, and, you know, failing that, if you are really um, struggling to administer in state, um, you know, you, you could contract uh, a notary public or a lawyer to ask for some legal advice. Um, I would just make sure again that you get a sense of what the cost would be up front and certainly you can cost those expenses to the estate as well. And thank you for that, Peter. I think we have time for one final question. We're approaching the uh, one o'clock mark. And again, thank you uh, for all of uh, your participation and your que questions here. Uh, last question, Peter. Uh, you mentioned that some of the greener options are not available yet in British Columbia or in Canada. Could you please speak to some of the greener options that are available today that some of our audience members can go and inquire about? So really, I mean, again, I think the, the, I mean, again, and there's always discussions about, you know, which options are green, which are better, which are less green. If you speak to some folks, they would adamantly, you know, defend cremation as a greener option than burial. If you speak to other folks, um, you know, they would be saying, no, cremation is really bad for the environment, again, because of the emissions of carbon dioxide. So there is this kind of, you know, ongoing debate about, which options are more harmful to the environment. Um, I think when you look at what's currently available in British Columbia, um, you know, I think for me, I think the greenest option that's currently available is what's considered a green burial. <clears throat> so again, it's a burial, but it's it's kind of bypassing 
some of the more unfriendly aspects of, of burial in terms of not being buried in a casket, uh, skipping the embalming process, um, you know, kind of being essentially returned to the earth in what they're calling a biodegradable shroud. And it's been quite amazing and quite cool to see in recent years that um, a lot of cemeteries are offering that option. And I would encourage you to, there is a, a provincial resource called Green Burials BC. And so again, a really great resource uh, that provides a lot of information about essentially what is what does Green Burial entail. And I believe they also list some of the uh, the sites or cemeteries around British Columbia, they're offering green burials. Um, yeah. And if I could just add, I, I do think it's just a matter of time um, before um, acclimation or the alkaline hydrolysis will be available in Canada and BC. And I do think uh, personally, I do think that the human composting piece or technology um, again, is probably one of the most environmentally friendly, and we'll be curious to know when that uh, eventually becomes available in, in Canada as well or in British Columbia. Great, thank you, Peter. And uh, we're gonna wrap up our presentation today with one final poll uh, for audi our audience members here. And the question is, how likely are you now to give more thought to end of life planning now that you've had this opportunity to uh, join us this afternoon. So the poll is up. If you could please uh, take a moment to, to uh, share your, your vote and we'd really appreciate it. Okay. We will uh, tally the votes and we're looking at 54% already thinking about it. So that's really great to hear. I uh, would like to take this opportunity to thank Peter for joining us this afternoon. That was extremely uh, helpful and useful information. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us and participating in this uh, engaging presentation. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to the Memorial Society of BC uh, or reach out to Van City. Uh, you're more than welcome to also book a, an estate and will consultation uh, with our consultant. Uh, again, uh, there is a lot to consider when it comes to estate planning and end of life planning. So I'm hoping that you found a lot of this information useful. And like I said, we will be sharing a recording of this presentation. And this is the first of a three part series around estate planning. So stay tuned for uh, more information about the next uh, webinar. With that, I'd like to say thank you and have a great rest of your day.